<laughs> Another old bloke turned up, so here we go again. It's us. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, did you comb your hair? <laughs> anyway. Oh gosh, I'm lucky to have any hair to comb these yeah, days. Yeah, yeah. I was, I was really surprised. We were. When, when did I bump into you yesterday? Yeah. Yeah, in the rain out the front. And there's, well, there's Robin. So it was fun to catch up and uh, grabbed him. You're only here. What are you doing? A three day trip or something? Quick three day trip just to see the boats at the finish. See Jean Luc. See Mark Slats. Yeah, look yeah, at the boats. Cool. Look at what. Uh, what looks damaged and what doesn't look damaged and um, go back home and work on my boat again. Yeah, fantastic. Okay. And uh, and you got lost. <laughs> we oh. were all, we, we, we you, you, some of you, in fact, most of you will probably remember, Robin left here, great fanfare and said bye-bye. And then um, and then all of a sudden we get reports that, oh, he's overdue. Um, so uh, one minute, what happened? <laughs> well, the brief story is, hey, it just took a lot, lot longer than I thought it was going to do. It was a lot of calms, a yeah. lot of light winds. And I just got a, a very, you know, circuitous route out round to the north of the Scillies almost to, to pick up the wind and, and sail into Falmouth. So it took a lot longer and um, I think there was just a bit of a misunderstanding of quite when I might arrive and, With family. Uh, and so on, something yeah. like that. Family, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so uh, anyway, all is well, it end, ends well. And um, this is uh, true. we're glad to see you here. <laughs> well, I'm always pleased to be here. I mean, Sabla de Long, lovely place. Oh yeah, true, true. It's cold now anyway, it's cold and windy. In fact, funny things, uh, you know, there's a lot about Jean-Luc and uh, uh, Mark arriving. Um, Jean Luc got in and tied up. We finished the deal, and we got blown out of the the, the tent. And that night it was blowing like sixty knots here. Oh, big uh, it just time, went yeah, nuts. Yeah. And then when Mark came in, it was a fantastic night out there. We we had a problem, by the way. Sorry, we, our live. We were on the boat, and uh, we had a problem on the boat. We had to go back in and get some kit for the boat. And by the time we got back out, we missed the, missed him crossing the line by about five six minutes. So anyway, we got back up. Uh, and it was a beautiful starry night, clear sky. We got in, we did all the stuff, you know, about two o'clock in the morning and, and so on. And then all of a sudden it just started to bucket down with rain. So we were really lucky with Jean-Luc and lucky with Mark as well. And now it's a beautiful sunny day out there. Anyway, so a couple of things. First of all, this is Jean-Luc signed Citran Bear. And uh, there is a highest bidder there for that. Um, oh, smell that. <laughs> That's boat smell. <laughs> Yep, this is Jean Luc's bear. This boat, this bear's been, this, this bear's been around the world. Yeah, it's Jean Luc. So it uh, went for a bargain actually, um, but we thanked the top bidder. I think it was about three hundred euro. I thought it would have gone for a lot more. This this is a priceless bear. We've got the photos for it. Jean Luc signed it, uh, and uh, yeah, he's a beauty. And it'll go with a poster, which will also be signed with Jean Luc. And all that money goes to uh, Citran, our charity, which is all about uh, motor neurone disease and uh, um, uh, Alzheimer's and Parkinson's and so on. So thank you for that. And if you know, I've still got. I don't know how many emails to reply to and comments, you know, probably 150 or so. I'll, I'll be getting through them. People saying thanks for the GGR and everything that we've done. And if you want to help us, um, you know, it'd be great to get on the our charity site, on the website, and maybe think about making a donation. And uh, there'll be a few more things happening here. We had hoped to announce a big special deal uh, already uh, for the prize giving for a special couple coming into town, which I'll probably do tomorrow because we're just finalizing details, but it's gonna go something like this, that uh, if you make a donation of more than 25 euros onto the, the Citran site, uh, and you will be a VIP to join all the entrants to a special dinner on the night before the prize giving. The accommodation will be carried on here. Um, you'll be VIP at the prize giving the following night. There's a whole series of things happening there and, and you can have as many entries as you want. So as many 25 euros as you want going in there. Um, so it's something really special. You'll actually get to mix it with all the, all the, the entrance and uh, so on. But, but we hope to announce that with a live tomorrow. So that's Jean-Luc Citran Bear. Now the other big news, you've already got yours. This is oh this is how this is the gold coin. You see that? Boom. Comes in a padded pouch, a little plastic cover. Oh, I better not drop it. And this these are the gold coins. I don't know whether that how good that's coming up, but um, they're really cool. There's 313 of these now. In fact, that's a story. I should tell it you is. the story on this. If you look in Robin's book, it says on the map, and this is on the official GGR poster, that it was a 313 day circumnavigation. Correct. And they did the calculations and they printed the book and they got it out there and someone pointed out the fact that there's such a thing called the international date line. <laughs> yeah. And it's actually only 312. So, so anyway, um, but anyway, there's 300 and 
13 of these have been struck and um, they're really cool. Um, the only way you can get, well, there's only 100 going out to the public. The others are giving to uh, people associated with the event, like Robin's got one and a lot of the people here that have been involved have got one, but 300 available, they're 15 euro. And for now, until you, Uku arrives, the only way you get one is to uh, be a real GGR family member and buy it with something else because um, it's easier for us to send these out with the poster and a few other things than just by itself. Um, after that, any of the left after Uku gets here, we'll, um, we'll actually uh, have them available as individuals. And if you're a local in the Saab de Lone, uh, you can call into the office and pick them up. So that's the back, back cover, you're seeing all the bits. So that's the gold coin, which is really pretty cool. Um, and that'll become a GGR tradition on into the future. We'll have one next next time around with Matessio and stuff. But um, okay, so what are we going to talk about? First one, um, Jean Luc <coughs> and Mark Slats are moored out the front here. One rigs up here, one rigs down there. That's and, right. Um, yeah. uh, it's an interesting subject. That's the first one we should just quickly go over. Yeah, and I mean when you just look at them, you can see the difference. It's yeah. it's very very uh, obvious. Yeah. Yeah, it's very topical, and and um, a lot of people asking a few questions, and here's some some answers. So, uh, so Robin and myself and Jean Luc sat around and talked for about an hour about storm tactics with his survey and report that he's doing, and also the mast. And Jean Luc told me something that was really a revelation about his mast. And I'll, I'll keep it brief. Basically, uh, uh, with the rules of the GGR, you have a maximum height of the mast, a maximum length of the boom. It's totally legal to decrease the sizes of specifications. You just can't make them bigger. The next one is that on the wire rigging, you can have any rigging that's heavier, but you can't go thinner, right? That's common sense. You don't want light rigging that's gonna break. When Jean-Luc had his mast redesigned for the shorter length, um, he asked me, he said, can I have my real, my lowers, that's the wires going from the bottom of the, the, the first spreader to the deck, six millimeter. And I said, no, you can't because the original was eight millimeter. You must have eight mil. So he said, okay, I'll go eight mil. As you know, the bolt tore down through the section of the mast. Now we discussed everything with Jean-Luc after he got pitch poled and rolled over. Um, the sum components of the rigging stretched, but the lowers didn't stretch, okay? And there's uh, there's a situation now where the designer and Jean-Luc are absolutely adamant that the reason the bulk tore down through the mast was because the, the lowers were eight millimeter. They wanted six mil, because if it was six mil, which matched all the rest of the rigging, it would have stretched at the same amount and not created that hard point. Mm. And it's like the wing of a plane. If you, the wings of aluminum wings of the plane, they flop like a bird. Uh, when you take off, you can watch them go up as it takes the load and weight of the plane. Um, if you put a hard point there, that creates, stops the structure of flexing and creates a load point. And they're saying that that's probably why the bolt went through. And um, I was, it made sense to me. <laughs> but on the one hand, it's totally counterintuitive, you yep. know, that this should be the case. But having, you know, heard heard the argument, and if that's what the mass makers are coming up with. Um, they yeah. probably are correct. Yeah, it's interesting. But John Link never told me at the time that he was worried that it was hard point. Mm -hmm. But they've come to that conclusion. The Sparcraft are pretty slick. They build rigs for big boats, you know, like serious boats. And, and Jean Luc's never had a problem before. So uh, from that, we will now probably have a statement with the notice of race for 2022, where we will not get involved with any aspect of the rig other than the fact that uh, you can't go over maximum dimensions and if you've got inline spreaders, you must have inline spreaders, like you can't change the position of the chain plates, things like that. And we will leave the section size and the rigging dimensions up to the individual. Because I mean, you wouldn't go so light that you to save weight. No one's gonna do it to save weight. They're gonna do it to, you know, well, it's a trade-off, you see, yeah. if you save weight to try and go faster, then you have a weaker rig. rig, but you really have to make sure that your rig integrity and strength yeah. is is paramount, because yeah, yeah. You, you, you are, you are not going to sail around the world through the Southern Ocean without having the kind of storms and knockdowns and pitch poles. Those kind of things can happen to anybody, and they're going to tear a rig apart if it's not... Um, yeah. 
as good as it can be. The one thing I did say then straight away though, I said, okay, yeah, it tore the mast, but it, you could have put a doubler plate right where the spreaders mm -hmm. came on and where that boat thing to double the thickness of the, the wall thickness of the mast, and that probably uh, would have had a similar effect. It might have stopped it tearing down the mast. Yes, it, probably, yeah. it, it, it certainly should have helped. And I mean, we've talked about it in the past, yeah. this doubler, and in fact, doublers are going on mine, you know, in due course. Yeah. And how was your new rig? Because Robin <laughs> fitted, you know, tell the story, you fitted Jean-Luc's new original. I've got Jean-Luc's taller rig, the one before he fitted the short rig, so I'm very happy with it. I mean, I, I got the rig, the, the, the rigging, the furling gear, the sails, the whole nine yards, and um, it's all up on my boat and working, and um, yeah, cool. it's going to be good. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, so with uh, it's, it's fascinating to look at the two boats side by side, eh? mm -hmm. and later on, just oh, in fact, I'm jumping ahead of myself here, just to give you a rundown on what we're going to do. Um, sometime within the next week, I'll ask Mark if he's freed for a bit of time to go all over his boat with the live, uh, get him talking about all the components, the things that you've all heard us talking about, and so on. So, so that's something to look forward to. He's with family and friends right now, and probably getting a good sleep and eating truckloads of fuel. <laughs> he, he left his uh, not fueled food I mean food he left his good clothes here uh, he didn't sleep the first night came in grabbed the good clothes and changed here and we we're looking at it thinking holy dooly his whole butt's gone you know lower body like they've all lost a bit of weight but the yeah. lower legs and everything is, is really yeah I think that down. that's probably you know looking at Mark and uh, Jean-Luc on stage yesterday yeah um, that was my big impression was yeah they both lost quite a lot of weight yeah, yeah obviously yeah. lower weight and you know that's what's yeah what that's can normal only be expected that's it's normal. normal yeah yeah, yeah. exactly so yeah. Uh, uh, speaking of food um, Uku is running out of food and we're not sure yet how much that's going to be a story to to <laughs> follow up with because these guys turned up and they've got heaps of food left heaps of boring food, food yeah. maybe but yeah. heaps of food yeah you know so. I think it's a pretty big story because I can't imagine trying to scrabble by on well I did once I, I, I ran out of food after I uh, lost the rudder going to Cape Town yeah. and I had 20 you know 20 days of food left and it ended up taking me 24 five or six days from when I lost the rudder yeah, yeah. so I yeah. was down to like a third uh, you know a quarter a half ration then a third ration and so on so that by the time I arrived in Cape Town I had nothing but tea bags and uh, <laughs> um, Oxo cubes left. It was something like that, and uh, a lot of tea bags, but no milk, no sugar. So the tea bags were no good. Yeah. But uh, to start to go hungry on a continual basis over a long period of time is is a very hard road yeah, to hoe. Not good. I've got a, a relic from Jean Luc's boat. This is a Camembert. Mr. Camembert cheese that gave him all his cheese came over and gave me this. This is off his boat. So um, anyway, Tin he, cheese. He, yeah, he Looks good. Jean Luc had seriously good food for his trip. Oh, sure. um, so yeah, just finishing up on that. So yeah, within the next week, I'll try to get together with Mark and do that. And then sometime after that, we'll get together with Jean Luc because he's flat out with media and stuff. Um, but yeah, that that's coming. So watch out for that. That'll be quite a bit of fun. Um, Okay, so nothing else to talk about Mark's rig. You know, he's, he said, interesting point, and you probably all saw it, uh, he would go again without furling gear uh, after the whole thing. There's a, there's a trade-off on the whole mm -hmm. deal, and, and um, he said that was a real surprise. Well, it, it certainly is a surprise because, you know, I mean, he struggled in the Indian Ocean until he eventually, you know, got to terms with yeah. what was going on down there. Yeah. But, you know, Mark is a unique character. He's a, yeah. a very big, strong person, and... Yeah. That you know, sailing without furling gears, you know that's yeah. that's in his personality. Be that's in his drive and so on. So he yeah. he saw value in it. Yeah, be interesting to see what would have happened. And this is purely hypothetical because part of the deal for winning this race is be there at the end of the day. Absolutely. But he admired uh, Tommy uh, Abolish really highly. He mentioned it at the press conference, mm -hmm. and they were neck and neck. And Tommy was bearing down on Mark. And I wonder if Tommy had a pass mark, whether Mark would then be thinking, I, I, you know, whether he changed his mind. Because personally, I think furling is the only way to go in the Southern Ocean. <laughs> well, and you know, when when you look at the progress that Tommy and Gregor were making, yeah, yeah. as as you know, uh, uh, before that storm that took them out, um, 
the, the likelihood was that you know by Tasmania they would have caught an overtaken mark yeah, at, that, at that particular stage of the race and the way each individual was sailing. Yeah, absolutely. The, the other thing that uh, someone might have picked up, um, came up in discussion was that with uh, the short rig that John Lucas got, he did what I did back in the BOC days where he had a shorter rig but he's got a full roach mainsail which is mm -hmm. legal and mm -hmm. such that you can't tack the boat mm -hmm. or jibe it Mm -hmm. with full hoist because mm -hmm. it hits the backstay so you've got mm -hmm. to have one reef in anyway mm -hmm. to get past but it means then where's your long distance you're not tacking all the time or mm -hmm. driving you get out there go full hoist and you get a reasonable amount of sail area up there um, and I don't know whether Mark had that I think he had just a normal leech on the main yeah because he didn't I talk about dropping it, I haven't you know? looked at the pictures that yeah, yeah. closely yeah yeah because that's that's something which will slowly get out you know I mean I would have thought that if you've got the tall rig light air big roach that's normal and even water ballast hasn't been discussed yet but I'm sure it'll come up between now and there Philippe was using water ballast I would have used water ballast if I was in there yeah I noticed in, <laughs> I noticed in Philip's written account you yeah. know he uh, he he mentioned that he was he was using some yeah water. yeah well it was my plan as well you know if I had been going I had all my weight in the middle of the boat and had containers of water it's totally legal and in fact it begs the question I mean this sounds corny but you could even take bladders and fill them up with water if you want so so we might have to think about this for the <laughs> how do you make a rule against it but um, yeah yeah, it's, that's putting all the weight, for those non-sailors, put all the weight on the high side of the boat. You see normally sailing, you've got eight crews sitting out there to put ballast there to make the mast stand up high, firmer, and it gives more power and more drive, and it really works because we both sail underwater ballast and it's a huge difference. Yes, having a yeah. water ballasted boat. But of course, a water ballasted boat is generally designed yeah. to be a water ballasted yeah. boat and to make the optimum use of the the weight of the water on one side or the other, whereas these boats are not really designed for that. So whilst there may be some benefit, the the benefits aren't going to be quite as great yeah. as, as what we expect, I don't and, think. And from an organiser, you can see, you know, there's certain ways you write a rule or a definition, and there's always another way to, to you know, you can squeak it right up to the line, you know, yeah. which is really challenging. A, um, uh, let, let's let's do while we talk about that about the bloody radios and all this stuff i mean there's stuff everywhere that is suggesting that john luke's cheated and that mark slats has cheated and bloody all this stuff it's a load of rubbish i gotta tell you in, in okay with a ggr i can tell you now as far as i'm concerned right now here as of today i can guarantee you that we have no impression or no intuition or idea that any entrant in the ggr has done any cheating that's as of today and I'll explain it like this most people don't understand what the definition of routing is and mm -hmm. whether we've discussed this a few times the important there's a couple of important definitions here that most people don't get a private weather forecast is a weather forecast from an individual that is not public knowledge okay and that I'll put it in the first context Philippe Pesch and Jean-Luc paid th huge amounts of money uh, to get an, a private weather analysis and weather routing for their voyage around the world, uh, which stopped one month before the race. So they paid an expert to sit down for a number, you know, a huge amount of time, analyze the weather systems all the way around the world, mm -hmm. look at the polar diagrams of the boats, right, the speed at different wind angles and so on, play those models all the way around the world and work out the best course and the best places to be at certain times of the year um, uh, based on average weather and average boat speed and do diff three or four different versions. So as they start off, they say, here you go and do this, and da -da -da. a month later, if you're here, you do that. If you're here, you do this. And three months later, if you've now got to there at that time of the year, you do that. If you're a little bit early or a little bit late, you do that. And they pay a lot of money for that. It has to stop at least four weeks before the start of the race, mm -hmm. okay? And that's, that's weather routing. The next version of that is that if someone is on the radio and they're looking at Windy TY and uh, they're you know, looking at and say, right, well, based on where you are now, because that's public information for the guy doing it, um, the weather you know, 50 miles ahead of you is gonna do this in 12 hours, it's gonna do that in 24 hours. This is an explanation of public information, okay? And that's completely legal. That is not a private uh, weather forecast. It's not. It, it's something that's available to anyone. All they're doing is explaining public information. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's legal. It doesn't matter how defined and how specific it is. You know, it's all legal because it's not a private weather uh, analysis from an expert, right? Um, and secondly, um, 
the, the definition then, the second part of routing, is that if that person giving the windy tie TY information, which is very detailed public information that's being given as an explanation, says to the skipper, you now need to go this course and be it there at that time, and then later you go to that course at that time, and da -da -da, that's routing. They're giving specific instructions. I've not seen one bit of evidence that links those two together uh, at all to suggest anyone is cheating. And uh, it, there's a lot of confusion and misconception and we just let it go over the top because um, uh, at this stage I can tell you, no one's given me any information that suggests, that proves that anyone's getting routing in. So. Yeah, and the pro the, the, w one of the big problems is there's a lot of grey areas. Yeah, And yeah. I think a characteristic of any competition to some degree is that competitors will always go into the grey areas to try and... And they'll push uh, it right to the line. And optimise what Absolutely. they've got. Yep. Uh, we're going to do it with our boats in 2022. We're yep. going to try and find take right to everything the line. within the rules that we're allowed to. But I, I, I think as long as the rules are, are, are very clearly defined and when we think we're getting close, maybe we've just got to you know, ask for a little clarification on yep. can we do this or can we not do this and Absolutely. Uh, you know, get, a, get an okay on it. So, um, and th that actually leads into my next statement. The heaviest user of safety calls in the GGR is Mark Slats. Okay, Mark brings me regularly, which is allowed under the rules, to discuss various things, um, and so that's all cool. Jean-Luc usually only rings me for a safety call, and in fact, I could probably, in fact, has exclusively only ever rung me, because I can't think of any other reason he rings me, is to get a rule definition, okay? And I give him approval on that. On the issue of weather routing and clarifying all these things, you know, weather routing, and also once we adopted the new rule mm. of GPS coordinates, he's probably rung me about, uh, probably about seven times, to specifically define what is allowed and what's not allowed, uh, to ensure that they're allowed to be given distance to the finish, that they're allowed to be given range and bearing from certain points or other entrants. Uh, he's clarified specifically every detail. And we've had people coming to me with emails, oh, look at this, he's been given this, that, and the other. I said, sorry, that's legal. They're all about this, blah, blah, blah. sorry, that's legal. So Jean-Luc himself is being the classic competitor a very true professional who does not want to cheat and he's clarifying all these things. Now I don't tell everyone and make a post every time he makes a call to me to check what he can and can't do, but I can assure you he has been approved to get every piece of information that he's got. So no cheating, you know, John Luke doesn't want to cheat, Mark Slats doesn't want to cheat. And finally on this one, the next issue is the radio licenses. We have nothing to do with, with monitoring and policing radio traffic, okay? So some an entrant um, is using a legal license, it's got nothing to do with us, nothing to do with GGR at all. It's just completely out of our responsibility, we, we, we're not involved. So that's, um, that's how that works, you know, and it's up to them what they do with their radios and it's up to the authorities to decide how they want to treat it. <laughs> so um, anyway, that's, that's uh, our take on that lot. Um, and in 2022 for GGR, we've more or less decided that, that uh, ham radios will be banned. You know, it's, it gets rid of a grey area again and, and stops a lot of the kerfuffle that's going on. And for safety-wise, we've got all the regulations, we've got um, access to all the maritime, um, you know, sort of networks and so on. So uh, watch this space. So next one, Andy Fowling. Mm -hmm, that's a good one. <laughs> a lot of barnacles in this race. Absolutely, a lot of barnacles. unreal. And I've got the answer from Jean Luc. But before Here it comes. before that, yeah. When you actually look at the two boats down there on the dock, they're both really remarkably clean and in, in great shape underwater. And the only real sign that they've, they've, they've done a great, great voyage around the world and the amount of time is when you actually look at the transoms that obviously they didn't clean. Yeah, But, uh, you know, so there's a, there's a lot of griminess way up the transom above the water line. So. Yeah. That tells a story as well. You know, the boats still looked as if they'd just come across the Atlantic or come back from, from a short trip, eh? Like so, you, you, you can't yeah. pick it. They don't look like Suhaili looked. <laughs> no, no, no. They're not all... You know, the equipment's, uh, the equipment's all good, you know? Like, um, you know, you looked at Mark's boat and he had that timber repair on the on the Aries windbane. Yeah. 
Um, that's a fantastic but, repair. That, yeah, that is cool. a marvelous, marvelous <laughs> repair he did yeah, there. Yeah, yeah, pretty cool. Um, but it, oh, you know, the systems, the mast looks fine, the sails look white, mm -hmm. bloody all the blocks and sheets and everything all look cool. So. It looks there, good. There's some good signs of wear and tear on the boats, yeah. mind you. But yeah. having said that, they're they're in they're in pretty darn good condition. Yep, yep, absolutely. So um, hey, let's let's start from the bottom. We'll keep John Luke for the last. You all know Tapio got completely screwed with his anti-fouling. He ordered proper, mm -hmm. really good anti-fouling. Yep. And uh, unfortunately, the yard that did it uh, went and bought the Baltic anti-fouling, which is really weak because the Baltic's sort of not quite, but half fresh water, half salt water, and it only needs a really mild anti style of anti-fouling, not up to the task, it's gone. So he, he copped that. Uh, Igor had a problem. They put good anti-fouling on in, in the med, sailed it from the med to Falmouth back here, pulled it out of the water, scrubbed the boat down, put it back in the water without replacing anything. They scrubbed so too much off. They scrubbed too much off and that's the juicy bits, so that's why he had the problems. Um, Susie, this was interesting. We discussed anti-fouling you know, months ago and we started thinking, oh, maybe copper coat's the way to go, maybe copper coat. And I was getting turned on by that until I found out that uh, Susie actually has copper coat. I didn't know mm -hmm. this. I didn't know that. Yeah, no, she's got copper coat and she put a top coat of anti-fouling on that, which was pretty much what I was thinking might have been a good way to go. And Susie had you know, issues with uh, not, not a huge infestation, but she had random uh, barnacles in Hobart, so she dived on it and cleaned the bottom. Mark Slats has got copper coat, that's all, which mm -hmm. was a revelation. I didn't even know that until about a month ago when we were talking right. on the phone. Right. Uh, the difference with Mark when he came into Hobart was that he'd already dived. He found the, mm -hmm. the barnacles you know, in the Great Australian Bight there and dived on it, cleaned it off, it's fine, looked at it in Hobart and it's sort of fine. But his big story was that when he got, he dived a few times through the South, South Atlantic and he thought he'd done, he'd done one big one with sandpaper, get it perfect, and a month later, four weeks later, in the, in the first part of the North Atlantic, the boat wasn't feeling right. This is just four weeks later, got over the side, and he said the whole hull was covered in little barnacles. Right. Which really cost him a lot. Mm -hmm. Dive took it off. And um, anyway, uh, Uku's got the usual average problems and stuff. So Jean-Luc arrives, and he's... His boat is like a baby's bum, <laughs> wouldn't you say? It's pretty clean. <laughs> it's, it's pretty it's clean. In it's in good shape. So he didn't, and so we. So here's the deal. Paint-wise, he had three layers of paint, one type, and he had a top layer of paint. We all knew that because uh, Lionel had told us uh, before that it was four layers of thing. It wasn't curry powder. It wasn't chili copper, powder. tin, chili <laughs> powder. It wasn't any exotic chemicals. No. Um, I've confirmed with Jean-Luc, he will write a written signed statement that it's all legal, right? It's all legal. And here it comes, da -da 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 drum roll. Um, it was um, All Grip Shogun, okay? Commercially available paint. So it's the All Grip brand, which sometimes trade under, what's the other one? Starlight. C-Jet. C-Jet. Okay, so All Grip is the company, the head company. Some parts of the world, it's, it's sold under C-Jet. You can Google this. If you Google Shogun, right, that's the anti-fouling he got. He bought it in a shop, you know, got the paint. It's commercial. It, anyone can get it. It's freely available. It's on the shelves right here. I've seen it. Yeah, okay. But he had two types of paint, okay, two because you... If you don't know any fouling, you can get a hard polishing paint. It's really hard, like a normal house paint, and that's for racing boats. And it, and it, you put it on, and you've got to. It's a, the worst part is getting it off because mm -hmm. you've got to get it off to put the next layer. So when you slip the boat, it's a pain in the butt. But if you want a really fast racing, it's a hard surface, right? We'd, you don't want that. The next one is a medium uh, medium uh, hardness, so it's not like a hard hard one. It's softer easy to manage. He had three coats of Shogun, which is uh, the middle polishing one. It's not a soft outer layer. It's, a, it, it's reasonably uh, firm and it's got a good ablative properties, right? But in the tropics, when you want the highest one, you have two things. You have the highest level of uh, biocide, which kills all the, the, um, uh, you know, the growth, and you want the softest you can get because you're not moving a lot. And when you do start moving, because it's soft, all the bugs and mold and or slime and barnacles on it will actually get pushed off with the boat speed. So he had three layers of the middle hardness mm -hmm. with normal ablative properties. And the final layer was the softest one. It's a purely ablating wash away. 
uh, and it takes the, the barnacles with it. And his plan was that by the time he got down through the, the Atlantic on the first leg, that whole first layer would be gone. He'd be entering the, uh, the rest of the race through the Southern Ocean up the top with three layers of Shogun uh, uh, paint. And that's it, end of story. Nothing more to say. <laughs> that's right, and, that, and, that's, and that's pretty much exactly what I've got on my boat. Yeah, yeah, so, um, uh, yeah, he's already using it. I'm all, um, I, was all, I was pretty confident that I, I had a good, uh, you know, anti-foul setup for my yeah, boat. Yeah, so so that's all interesting news, and there'll be more on that, I'm sure, when we, you know, as things go in, we'll find more details, but looks like you can't go wrong with all grip. <laughs> They're not giving me any paint, there's nothing like that, but everyone was fascinated with that. Um, interestingly, uh, the other there's other boats going around in the long route now, and a lot of them have had serious problems with barnacles. Yes. Um, and uh, Mark said in the press conference he'd never seen anything like it. Uh, he'd been around solo nonstop before, nothing at all like this. Is something changing? It sounds like it might be. Uh, I don't know. You know, it's who knows. I think you know a lot of the regulations are making the anti fouls a lot less effective than what they used to be. Yeah, I think it might be a combination of both things. Because you're right, and warmer yeah. waters. Warmer waters. Mm -hmm. Who knows what? I don't know. But um, but anyway, that's the that's the story of mm -hmm. um, uh, the anti fouling. So that's good to know. Um, and as I said, with John Luke, we'll get to talk to him in depth on his boat about all sorts of subject in the whole English sessions and then whole French sessions. So, but a, a lot of this anti fouling comes down to the preparation you've put into yep. that boat yep. before it even goes in the water. Yeah, yeah, too true. Yep, absolutely. Um, so let's just tip top a couple of things. So um, uh, Mark Slat's boat. Mark is Mark's boat's going to be here for about. Uh, a week, I believe, and then Mark apparently is going to sail it back home. No. I couldn't do that, no way. <laughs> no, I, I, I was saying if if I would got if I got to the finish about now, the boat would be sitting here until after the April prize giving. I wouldn't want to be going sailing yep. in a hurry at this moment. I take my hat off to him. <laughs> he's gonna. I'd put a crew on as they take it home because he's huge publicity in at home. You know, in, in you know in the media and everywhere, and uh, you know got people want to see the boat, so he's got to get it up there. And um, uh, who knows? So that's that's the story. There. Good for him. Um, Gregor on uh, his boat. The hunt is on. Okay, we can't say much more than that. But he's uh, at the moment. Uh, it's all coming together slowly but surely. It's and, good. I, I, and I hope they find it. I hope they yeah. recover it. Oh, here's it. another and I, one. And I hope Gregor's um, on board uh, it for the next race. Absolutely. So do I. The next race made me think of something. Uh, you, the Gregor, yeah, he, he wants to come back, so hopefully he will. Uh, Mark dropped an interesting comment uh, at the press conference. We were joking about 2052 or something to do, redo the GGR, but in the press conference he actually mentioned that, uh, I don't even know whether he, he realised he said it, that uh, he said maybe that's why I might do it again. <laughs> well, you know what, and it's only human nature, really. I mean, if you come second, you, you kind of figure, well, maybe I could come back and just do it again number one that's right absolutely i mean you know, so I, I i wouldn't be at all surprised and you know yeah. he, he'll be a pretty fierce competitor absolutely next time. he knows what 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 it is now and, and he, he knows how to do right. it and he that's came right. second and that was you know incredible effort amazing story we don't need to go into it ever talk about it but what a guy you know anyway oh, great great sale without a doubt yeah um uku is running out of food <laughs> watch this space she's i hope he doesn't have to stop anywhere to get food Anyway, um, ah, another one. Ba -da -da -da. Loic Lepage. Loic turned up. It was great to see him. He's really enjoying life. I saw Loic yesterday and he was saying, yeah, he wants to do it again. Absolutely. Uh, we're going to have a get together because he, 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 it cost him a lot. It, it, he's, I think he said it was about 70,000 euro or something totally, you know, back to basics. And he doesn't have a lot of money. He's got a great story. He, he wants to go again. He needs to find a sponsor. And we just basically said to him, okay, let's get together. He needs to start talking now. And mm -hmm. he'd be a great, great great story for a sponsor you know and you know he, he was sailing well you know the boat he was sailing really well he was, was he going. was he was he, he he was sailing you know a good race he yeah. was he, he he wasn't slow he was yeah. he was getting on with it yeah exactly and and uh, anyway and he had the oldest mast in the fleet you know, it was the original mast, lots of old holes in it. Yeah, that's right. But I mean, for the next race, we're, you know, that's going to be a kind of a different scenario on old masts, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, they yeah. aren't going to be old masts. No, nope. no, everyone's learning. You know, everyone's so. learning. So uh, it'd be great to see Loic back. Um, no more news on on uh, on um, uh, Igor. What I will say, though, Igor made his statement that he's got a medical issue and mm -hmm. won't be back at the start of November. I just thought it was, he made another po another video 
uh, about three weeks later, he looked really sad in that video, and I, you know, just wish him all the best. You know, uh, you know I can under, it, you know, it has to be a great sadness for ego, ego, because, you know, he really, he really did do a great job in the yeah, Atlantic yeah, yeah, in the yeah. early stages, yeah. and then kind of got caught out in the calms and got slow and then got yeah. the barnacles yeah. and there was the anti-foul problems and so on and that yeah. really slowed him down so you know it, he must on the one hand yeah it, and it takes a long time to get over yeah, yeah, doing yeah. one of these races even if you're successful if you're not successful and you've you know pitch pulled out or whatever it is it can take a long time to get your head back together and get your yeah. enthusiasm back yeah. But you know what, Eagle, Eagle will be back in 2022. I think he'll be back and do a good sale home next next November, you know, December, yeah. next winter. Yeah. But he'll, he'll come back to compete again if yeah, he can. Yeah, absolutely. I just, I mean, we know nothing about his medical condition. No one's obviously talking, it's obviously private. I just hope he's okay. You know, that's the main one. So um, yeah, we look forward to seeing you back there, Igor, mm -hmm. if you're watching this. He sent a great message. He put a post up on Esmeralda OK. Just congratulating Mark and, uh, Mark and uh, uh, Jean-Luc. Um, oh. Intel, nothing from Nabil, but it, Nabil is out there sailing his boat back to uh, America. We had a fan said, why is, why is he not up on the tracker? And I said, what do you mean? And he says, he's not on the tracker, he's going across the Atlantic. I said, what? <laughs> so so uh, good, Nabil good, is sailing. Good, good for Nabil. Yep, I mean, yep. I hope he gets the boat back to the States happy and, yep. you know, uh, does some good miles. And I'd love to see him know, back in the race. Well, I'd love to see him back in the race. He's got three years to, you know, yep. put, put a good act together and yeah, be, yeah, be yeah. really well prepared. Yeah. So, yep. you know, he should be able to do that if that's what he really sets his yeah. mind on doing. Absolutely. Tommy, it's official. Tommy is trying to get back in 22. That's a good thing. That's a very good <laughs> That's a good thing. thing. And, uh, oh, I gave the wrong things before. This is Mark's boat. This, uh, this is, um, this is uh, Jean-Luc's boat. That's Jean-Luc's uh, boat. Bit of, bit of interesting news. Uh, I'll keep it very simple because it'll be, it'll, or I don't know whether I should say it or not. But anyway, let's just, let's just say this. Jean-Luc and I have had a discussion and maybe uh, we might be selling his boat for him. <laughs> okay, uh, we may be selling his boat for him, and uh, it'll be an interesting story. So if you're GGR22, hold your breath. Don't talk to Jean-Luc. He's not interested there. He's already said no. You can sell the boat for me. Um, so we'll um, we might be talking about that next week, uh, or a week or so, because uh, Jean-Luc's flat out now. He has got so many media things. It's unbelievable. Jean-Luc <laughs> will be snowed under for weeks. It's you know, real. I mean, I would love to spend uh, you know a few hours talking to Jean-Luc, but. <laughs> Realistically, no, sorry, he's, he's not available. Well, it's not about him not being available. <laughs> he is so darn busy. He's got so much stuff to take care of. And, yeah. uh, you know, in six weeks' time, when I come back again with my boat, hey, he'll have all the time in the world for me. Absolutely. Um, we haven't talked about this, but how good was the win? You know, from, us, from GGR's perspective, um, you know, Jean-Luc winning the race was the best thing that could have ever happened to us um, because he's local. He's, a, he's an old bloke with a dream that's achieved something incredible uh, and it just couldn't have been well in fact Susie coming first would have been better <laughs> for us uh, and Jean-Luc coming second would have been fantastic but there you go uh, but yeah it was a fantastic ending for the G like for a winner for us sure. for the GGR it's um, you know the finish was phenomenal uh, Jane and I spoke about this if you had a vision of what would be your wildest dreams for the finish of the race it was probably half as big as what it turned out to be we couldn't believe it. We, in fact, I forget we haven't spoken to people about this. There were some big crowds. Oh, it's there. phenomenal. Um, we, uh, you know, we went out first, you know, to go out uh, early in the morning, and there was a nice, you know, there was a nice bunch of people mm -hmm. there. So, well, isn't that good? It's a Tuesday morning in the rain, yep. you know, all that sort of stuff. And there's this good place. When we came back, we were just gobsmacked. We could not believe it. It was the whole town must have shut down. There were a lot of people. There's oh, a, the, 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 they were welcoming Jean Luc. And, yeah. Yeah, but. You know, I know Mark came in, you know, late in the evening at midnight ish. Yeah, well, were you uh, there? Were you out there? I was out there on the jetty. Oh, jeez. Um, <laughs> we could have got him a ride. He's just being humble. No, no, no. <laughs> I, 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 I really oh, wanted was, to go see it from the jetty and I enjoyed it. It and, was fantastic. Uh, it, it, was, it was great. Because this was, this was like, I forget the exact time, it was like one o'clock in the morning or something and there was cars and people yeah. and we had, as we went out, there was people buddy, sitting on deck chairs and all that sort of stuff yeah. waiting and it was really cold. And, and, uh, and then when they came back in, they'd been obviously following the live. They're all in their cars. This is jack a chock a block with cars tooting their horn. But you know what? We went out on the jetty yeah. and the... Um, all of a sudden we started to run out of people 
Yeah. <laughs> and I thought, oh well. And then all of a sudden, this great wave came right over the uh, the the, uh. the the structure at the end of the jetty, and we got soaked. <laughs> We got so, yeah. There's some good hey, seas running. It was it was there were some big seas yeah. running. You, yeah, they you were. Know, look at the boats rocking yeah, and rolling yeah, yeah, as yeah. they were coming yeah. in. Yeah, yeah, yep, exactly. Mm. Anyway, um, yeah. So we were ecstatic. You know, you, you got to love Le Sable alone. You got to love the French people, no matter what anyone says. You know that, as in, uh, you know, they're passionate about this stuff. They they're understand in, adventure. They're and, enthusiastic. And, uh, oh, it's incredible. You know, we we just we just love that aspect of it, and uh, we're now officially talking to Le Sable alone about 2022. Because we uh, we would love to be here again, and let's hope it happens. And uh, uh, yeah, there's interesting interesting times ahead. So thank you for all of the good wishes of people all around the world saying, "Wow, GGR, GGR." Never forgetting, of course, that we've got Uku, uh, Istvan, and Tapio out there. So um, mm-hmm. uh, all all kind of good. Three still to finish. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, okay. So when, what's your when, when's Tapio getting to the horn? Uh, in about four days. Four days. Four, four, hey, five days. Yeah. That'll be a great day because then you yep. know they'll all be. Oh, absolutely. And then Uku is only a day away from the equator. The equator. This one's yeah. coming up behind. Yep. We'll talk about that when I do the thingos. But yeah, it's still still kind of fun stuff, and, mm-hmm. and that's all good. So, what's happening for you for the next year? What are you doing? I, I always say I don't know. I mean, getting ready for 2022. I mean, we're we're right at the moment. I'm you know I've got the bow rails and the stern rails off the boat being modified now to uh, you know at the front of the boat to house the spinnaker poles and at the yeah, back yeah. of the boat to give me big access to get to the steering gears yep. and and yep. stuff like that. Uh, then we're we're pretty much set then to go out and. Um, you know, see what the ocean. You know, see what she really feels like in some proper wind, and and yeah. so on. And um, you know, but the priorities from from my point of view is, you know, how do you how how do you really you know steer and handle these boats in big winds? Yeah. So we've got our drogues and our towing warps and things like that, and we're going to go and try them and see how they work out. Um, yeah. You know, we, we've got to dust the sextant off and go out and switch the GPS off and use the sextant and <laughs> all this kind of stuff. So there's, 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 there's a lot of stuff to do in, okay. the next, in the next few months. Okay, here's another bombshell because a lot of people will have gone by now. They start watching the first 10 minutes and yeah. then they're yeah. gone. Yeah. So for all of you diehards that are still watching two old blokes here, here's a revelation. This was interesting. I forgot I've got this uh, about the Jean-Luc and the storm. You know, uh, uh, Robin, Sir Robin and I and uh, Jean-Luc had a, a fantastic session here the other day talking about all the storm stuff. And uh, here's the next thing that was a real, real uh, eye-opener, not a shock, but an eye-opener. Um, and it goes something like this. So there's this big debate about what do you do, slow down or keep going, slow mm-hmm. down or keep going. You probably heard Mark's opinion when it's in the conversation on the dock when he got in with Jean-Luc. Mark's of the opinion, keep the boat moving, go fast, keep it sailing. He likes to even have a bit of sail up front, uh, even in the heaviest of weather. So the boat's got sort of dynamic stability and it's alive, you know, it can go places. And uh, he tried everything and that's his conclusion, similar to Matessia in, in Joshua. Um, Jean-Luc is of a similar uh, opinion that he likes to go fast. He doesn't even carry a drogue. He's never set lines or anything like that. So the assumption always was, and I discussed this on the phone when Jean-Luc rang after his pitch pole, and uh, after his pitch pole when um, uh, he was in the storm, I just assumed that he was doing the usual thing, running with the waves, going down fast, and he did a pitch pole. So then everyone said, ah, see, told you, silly bugger, he should have been towing a drogue, Mm -hmm. okay? Because I usually tell people that, look, the GGR guys, when they're in really tough stuff, uh, they're in survival mode. They're not racing. They're looking after their boat, you know? They're doing the sort of things. Then I, so this is what Jean-Luc told me. He said, no, Jean-Luc said he made a mistake. And the mistake was evolved through a very simple principle. He, he likes the Rustler 36, not like his big boat, but it's a good boat. It's got 43% ballast ratio. It's very stable. He's got the shorter, lighter mast. He was never worried about knockdowns or rollovers because mm. he had faith in his boat. Yep. He was on his way to Cape Horn, okay? And that dictated a certain course. So I'm back the front to you guys. Um, but he was sailing down towards Cape Horn. The storm came along and Jean-Luc wasn't running dead downwind. Jean-Luc was at an angle to the wave, still racing, mm-hmm. okay? He was still sailing on a, pref- on a course, a preferred course, rather than the safest course, okay? 
Um, this is going to cause a stir. Um, he sh he said he made a mistake. He should have gone back onto a safe course, running dead downwind. But he didn't believe that it was that bad. And I have to say, when we heard about John Luke's pitch pole, mm -hmm. I, I, we were all surprised. Said, what? Because now, in hindsight, he's right. Looking back at the weather, the weather wasn't extreme. It wasn't extreme like Mark and Gregor and thing. It wasn't a 70, 80 knot gale with 15 no, metre seas. It was a normal heavy weather situation. So that answers the question uh, that, that partly the reason why he went down was because of the fact that he was caught by a surprise wave uh, when he was on course that he wanted to go. He's clearly said to me and Robin that he, if he had have been on a course, a safe course, dead downwind, he doubts whether this whole thing would right. have happened. And I think, you know, that that's what that's what I'm thinking from my point of view of getting ready for the next race yeah. is I've got to go out there and try these things and uh, find out what works what and what limits. doesn't work and yeah. try with no ropes and no drogues yep. and no towing and yep. with drogues and with I, I've got to try stuff and, and, and come to my own conclusions because at the end of the day it's still I believe you know a very individual thing of how you actually handle these big waves these yeah. big storms yeah and there's always the strange one the big one the, the freak one everyone loves the word freak wave you know but because no, i reckon you know yeah it's, freak it's, waves actually exist absolutely. you know you, yeah, yeah. you uh, i've had them in the southern ocean and it's been relatively benign 30 yeah. to 35 40 knot winds day after day and all of a sudden i found myself going down a wave at, at, at such an angle you think where the hell did that wave come from yeah yeah and it was a, a, a one wave totally out of all the normals of the waves that you've had in the last two or three days or that you got two or three days afterwards yeah just one single wave and down you went yeah and it was a monster yeah so anyway so in summary to they that exist. lot yes yeah they exist in summary to that lot it's uh, quite a revelation uh, that Jean-Luc has said all that um, so it still maintains the theory of it's potentially as one option. It's okay to go dead downwind fast without droves, without bits and pieces, because uh, you know Mark survived. Uh, Jean Luc has conceded if he had been on a safe course, it probably wouldn't have happened. Um, so the debate continues. Well, not a debate, but there's all sorts of options. That's the thing at the end of the day. There'll never be a direct guidebook to say do this and no, do that. I don't it's think it can happen. be, but I, yeah. I, I think the the accumulative stories. You know, there's yeah. Jean Luc's story. There's Mark. You know, starting yep. to give his accounts. Yep. You know, we'd it's love to hear people think of options. Yeah, we'd know. love to hear Susie's detailed. Yeah, account. yeah, we will. Uh, we will get Tommy's that. detailed yep. account. Gregor's. Yeah. You know, in such a way that we can you know come to some conclusions as to what we could do or shouldn't do or, or might do or might try in our preparations yeah, yeah. okay we're running out of time i think yeah. anyway um okay final one um just robin doesn't know what he's doing for a year uh what we're doing with ggr is don't to despair if you've been addicted to GGR and you're worried what's going to happen when it stops it's not going to stop first of all 22 is coming up we'll be profiling and uh, exposing the new entrants on Facebook we'll be doing uh, there'll be lots of things happening you know I'll probably do a, a question that when it's all finished and everyone's home and done I'll probably do a monthly question and answer session as well and uh, there'll be lots of little mini features on you know mini lives anytime I see an opportunity that's of interest we'll run that up so the website still keeps going you'll see the new entrance pop up uh, you'll be new entrance the old guys will be history but they'll still be there so um, so there'll be things to keep you involved all the way through so uh, thank you for that where's Jane 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 <laughs> okay that's it goodbye. I could walk around the camera and turn it off yeah goodbye from us yeah goodbye from us well I'm not sure when we'll do it again but we'll do it again together soon <laughs> see you later <laughs>